Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Anthony Kazazis, and I am the director of the NYC Network Group, as well as the NYC Real Estate Expo. And I want to thank everybody for registering for today's webinar on sales and operations for new development, uh, sponsored by DMG Investments. DMG Investments was founded in 2013 and is headquartered in New York. DMG Investments is a leading global real estate investment management and development firm focusing on student housing, condominium, multifamily, and modular construction. By combining the joint expertise of their talented people, they are able to offer clients a vertical integrated investment platform resulting in outstanding reliability and the prospect of share growth. In part one, November 5th, DMG put together a panel modulator housing and new innovations in construction. November 19th, part two, DMG had their second panel, new directions of F&A, that's finance and acquisitions in multifamily assets. Now, part three, DMG will have their final panel of their winter webinar series, sales and operations for new developments. Their panelists will discuss overview sales records of new development in New York City and New Jersey, challenges and opportunities for new development in the tri-state area, new sales and marketing strategies for better promotions, operation challenges and new developments in multifamily residential leasing, how to balance and combine sales, marketing and operations. And after the panel, there'll be Q&A. Today's guest panelists are Kent Swig, president of Swig Equities, Paul J. Massey Jr., founding partner and chief executive officer of B6 Real Estate Advisors, Taryn Byron, president and broker of C.J. Dalton, as well as the lead con real estate consultant at DMG Invest, Christian Olone, vice president of asset management at DMG Investments, and our moderator, Richard Lorenzen, chief executive officer at Fifth Avenue Brands. At this time, I'd like to have each panelist just give a short one minute introduction on themselves. And let's start off with Richard. Sure, thanks, Anthony. Uh, my name is Richard Lorenzen. Great to be here with everybody this morning. I'm excited to be moderating uh, this event today. Uh, I'm the CEO of Fifth Avenue Brands. We're a public relations firm based in New York City. And we specialize in representing clients in the real estate and financial services spaces. Thank you, Richard. Taryn? Hi, my name is Taryn Byron. I am the president and broker of record for CJ Dalton, a real estate company in New Jersey's Gold Coast, specializing in luxury residential sales and new developments, both in multifamily leasing and sales. We represent DMG as their lead real estate consultant. And I also have the pleasure of serving as the sales director for DMG's condominium project, One Park Condos in Cliffside Park. It is a 204 unit condominium building that is perched atop the Palisades on New Jersey's Gold Coast. Every single one of our homes has outdoor space, 25,000 square feet of five-star amenities. And it's really an incredible building. Wow, sounds nice. Uh, Kent Swig? Yeah, hi, it's uh, Kent Swig. I am the president of Swig Equities, which is an owner developer of real estate throughout uh, New York City in the tri-state area and San Francisco. Uh, I'm also uh, an owner of a couple of operating companies, including Brown Harris Stevens, which is a residential firm, a uh, uh, Helmsley Spear, which is commercial, uh, Falcon Pacific, which is a construction company for both ground up and interior construction work. And then I'm a principal in my family's business, which is the Swid Company. We own about uh, 10 million square feet of office space around the United States. Thank you, Quint. Uh, Paul? Uh, thanks, Anthony. Paul Massey, I'm the CEO of B6, which is a uh, commercial investment sales and uh, debt brokerage firm. B6 stands for building by building, block by block, which uh, speaks to our dense urban market model. Um, we cover uh, each neighborhood in the five boroughs in New Jersey uh, and uh, Westchester. So the metro area, selling buildings and uh, providing debt for uh, refinancing construction loans and equity. Thank you, Paul. Christian. Morning, thank you, Anthony. My name is Christian Olin. I'm the name, Vice President Vice of Asset Management for the MG Investments. I oversee the leasing operations, uh, the 
uh, facilities maintenance of all of our operating properties, including our student housing portfolio, our condo building one park, um, and new developments um, and upcoming uh, developments for DMG investments. Um, so with that, I'd like to just dump, jump into a quick presentation of DMG investments to uh, share specifically our, um, our student housing portfolio. So as Anthony uh, mentioned, we uh, were founded in uh, 2013. We started with condo building, uh, specifically in condo development. Since then, we've really transitioned to developing student housing product in uh, communities across the country. Uh, we've been very successful with that, and, and I wanted to just discuss uh, quickly our coronavirus guidance. Um, I know that's a topic that's near and dear to everyone on the call's hearts, and it's, uh, it's really important to us to, to make sure that we're providing guidance and, and leadership in that area. So we developed an in-house uh, coronavirus guidance called our Auden Living Clean Program, where we implemented a operating standard and procedures for all of our student housing properties and communities across the country um, that meet the expectations for the CDC, um, as well as uh, state and local guidelines, make sure that we're providing best in class services for our, our residents and students, uh, but also have that peace of mind for our, uh, any partners that we have with those universities. Our portfolio is comprised of uh, a diverse set of properties across the country, um, including Albany, Ithaca, uh, Cornell University, um, Auden Houston at U of H and TSU, uh, Auden Upstate in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is our, our newest entry. Um, it delivered in August of 2020 with a very successful occupancy rate, even during a COVID era. Uh, we have a really exciting property right now coming online in 2021 in Buffalo and two in the pipeline um, that are actively being developed in another one in Albany and an additional asset in Ithaca. We have several properties in the pipeline uh, in pre-development stages as well. So it's a very exciting time for uh, development right now. Some overarching facts of Auden Living. Uh, we've got five operating properties right now in five different markets. Uh, we have 532 units uh, with over 1,300 beds. Um, our pipeline is really exciting. We're almost going to be doubling our bed count in uh, about the space of two, uh, two years here. So really exciting development opportunities for us. And we see a lot of uh, positivity in our student housing portfolio. Some uh, specifics about our portfolio. So Auden Albany is located in Albany, right across from SUNY Albany. Uh, 322 beds uh, opened in 2018. Auden Upstate, as I mentioned, it's our newest uh, property here opened in August of 2020, um, and that's in Spartanburg, Carolina. It's uh, adjacent to the university, just a really prime location for us, um, and just a, a really, really stellar community there. Auden Houston, uh, so we renovated this property and, and conducted a value add project there in 2019, um, and was very successful turning that property and, and uh, are achieving higher rents due to the efforts that we had there. Same story for Auden Ithaca. We took over this property um, and uh, conducted a renovation project. Um, you know, we are getting great rental rates right, right now and even are seeing very high occupancy levels during COVID due in part to our COVID clean living program and also the, the really stable market that we're seeing through uh, Cornell University. Auden Buffalo, as I mentioned, is our, our newest development. Um, it's gonna be opening August of 2021. Uh, we see a lot of encouraging signs from the Buffalo market um, and we're really excited to deliver this product. It's on time, uh, on track to deliver on time. So uh, just a really, really stellar project, 481 beds, 154 units. It's, it's going to be a, a really singular uh, property in that market. We're always looking for new opportunities, um, and, and I hope that you reach out and connect with us. Uh, we have a broad range of services that we provide from finance and acquisitions to uh, construction, uh, property management services as well. Uh, so we're always looking for new partners um, and we hope to connect with you soon. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, very well done. Um, this was uh, some great information regarding DMG's uh, products and services that you guys offer. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our moderator, Richard Lorenzen. Thanks, Anthony. So uh, for our first question, uh, Ken, I wanted to go to you and, and kind of get uh, your thoughts on the overall lay of the land. Could you tell us your views on the current state of the residential market? Sure. Um, first of all, we've uh, we've gone through as we're we're going through a very rough a rough period of time. 
um, with COVID. So it's, it's um, you know, my heart goes out to everybody in, in who's been affected by that. Um, the residential marketplace in New York City um, has been interesting. I would say pricing, I mean, transaction volume is probably down about 50% plus or minus um, over the you know, COVID period. Although the third quarter of this year, right? So third quarter of COVID versus third quarter pre-COVID um, has, has shown a lot of, of uh, activity going on. So in the one bedroom, the studio bedroom particularly, there's almost 80% increase in volume over the year previous. So I think what we're seeing is that prices have declined. And you know the, the merry-go-round of getting on to own a home in New York City has slowed down. So when it's going very fast, you jump on the merry-go-round, you get hit hard from one of the little horses if you're if you don't jump perfectly. Now that it's slowed down a bit and becomes a little bit more affordable, people are entering the marketplace. Um, a lot of first-time buyers, so I think they're recognizing that there's an opportunity out in the marketplace to 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 come in because prices have fallen. Um, and I would, would, would remind us that the third quarter did not have any kind of vaccine on the horizon at the time. So um, this was, these were people who were seeing through the COVID environment pre the announcement of a vaccine. Now with the vaccine, I think we're seeing a little bit, a lot more activity here and, and we're heading towards uh, a little bit more stability uh, in the marketplace. So Taryn, uh, with that said, uh, how have you seen buyers purchasing behavior shift during COVID? Well, I think that buyers have access to a lot more information nowadays. And when they are looking for a home, they want to go through this personal vetting process themselves. So the way that we actually market to buyers, especially during COVID has changed. We've had to be able to sell without doing property tours in many occasions and give the buyers that magical feeling that they get when they walk into their next home for the first time without ever having them walk into the home. So we've been able to do that, especially at One Park, very thoughtfully by leveraging technology, virtual tours, videos. And it was a very simple process on our end because we had already had experience in working with international buyers that were not even in this country. So we used a lot of those same tools um, when we were marketing to buyers. And we're also finding, as Kent mentioned, a lot more first time home buyers in the market. Interest rates are very low and people who were on the fence or even in roommate situations are now like, oh wait, I don't know where my roommate has been. <laughs> so let me go and see if I can find my own home and actually own a piece of real estate now. It's very exciting. Christian, uh, what would be some examples then of consumer changes uh, and how it's informed some of the upcoming marketing efforts that DMG has been doing? Yeah, you know, one thing that we've been really in tune with is, is understanding what the consumer is, is talking about and is concerned about and how we can cater our marketing messages to, to appeal to those concerns, right? So when, when someone goes to buy something, they're, they're typically looking to address an immediate need that they have. Um, and as Taryn mentioned, you know, we're, we're seeing buyers that are, and, uh, and consumers that are looking for some outdoor space, they're looking for privacy and controlled environment settings. So we're catering messages and, and packaging those to really amplify, uh, you know, how we can accommodate those needs. For example, at one park with, with all of our outdoor amenity space, you know, private balconies, um, you know, the, the gardens that we have there we're really, really amplifying those to make sure that, uh, you know, first time buyers or even uh, potential investors understand that um, that's something that they can, they can now get now that that's a concern. In a pre COVID setting, maybe that messaging was different. We really went more for our amenity package and our 25,000 square feet of, you know, top flight amenities. Um, now that has shifted to, they want to be able to control their environments. They want to have that privacy um, and, and ensure that the services that they're getting are always vetted. And so we're also seeing that on the, the service side as well um, and, and ensuring that our operations match the level of concern that um, and, and all the best uh, guidance that we have out there 
regarding COVID prevention. And that seems to be still what uh, you know the the consumers are concerned about is how are how are we protecting our communities and mitigating risk um, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And so we're we're keeping our consumers informed. We're keeping our residents informed about the practices that we're doing, um, in hopes that you know information. And, and solid information will, will inform best practices and positive behaviors for our consumers. Makes sense. So I'm, I'm also curious about land itself. I think that that's something that would be interesting to a lot of developers. Uh, Paul, uh, two part question to you. What have you seen happen to land pricing in 2020 and where do you see demand going in 2021? Um. Well, thanks, Richard. The, uh, first of all, it's it's great to be here with everybody. Um, thank you to Anthony for getting us together. Uh, you, everyone in the industry, loves what you do with your expos and your events, and uh, just just bringing people together uh, to talk and learn is great. I'm happy to be here with the DMG folks and Kent's an old friend, so I'm uh, in this crowd. I'm probably the least expert about the topic of development. Uh, but I, Thanks, but we do we, we do track land, uh, which, which which might be a little bit of a crystal ball into what what happens down the road, Richard. So, um, interestingly, citywide, um, the the top of the market in recent history um, was 2015 for development, and two couple of big things have happened they're they're obvious you know what they are but we had we, we had an oversupply of condos in the super luxury category and then we had our virus so um we went down from a high of 500 development sites selling citywide to last year 2019 because of uh, per perception of oversupply to 187 from 500 and people were starting to dust themselves off and realizing that that oversupply was just in uh, the, the, the super luxury end of things. We have a fundamental housing shortage in the city. So Q1 of 2020 was actually picking up volume. So we're gonna end up with 205 development sites, roughly, uh, roughly, cause the year is not quite over, um, selling so an actual uptick from 2019, uh, way below the way below the high the the high bar, but um, but but you know we're seeing development sites in the boroughs selling uh, to people who have a, a who have a, a a view of New York that it's going to come back. We're going to get vaccinated. We're going to be back in business. Um, so I think. Very interestingly, as rough as it's been, we're on an upward trajectory in terms of new development. So I think you're going to see more opportunity as a developer. Um, on the pricing side, the high was also in 2015. Citywide uh, price per buildable foot of development sites was 285. Um, because of the luxury oversupply, that dipped to $252. And the virus has really slammed uh, prices. Uh, banks are conservative. People are dealing with their own uh, imbalance and issues that they have. So we're projecting that um, from a high of $280 a buildable to last year, which was down to 252, we're projecting potentially price per buildable foot under 200 bucks. Which, which is really astounding. So you can guess where we think it's gonna go from here. And I believe it's gonna start trending up, but if now is not a buy opportunity, uh, I, I don't know what, I don't know what is. Hey Kent, what do you think about um, the, the impact that COVID has had on the market overall over this past year? You know, residentially or commercially, but I, I guess, why don't we take commercial for a second? Um, sure. So there, uh, first of all, there there are um, there. We have to take a look at the marketplace and see what is going to last beyond COVID. So our masks and social distancing, in my opinion, will not last beyond COVID. Once we get the vaccine, once people feel safe, once we are safe, I think that goes away certain aspects are going to impact ourselves. So working from home is one of the biggest issues that people are talking about. 
um, for the first three months of the COVID in starting in March, uh, we were fairly, we, you know, the, the, the United States industry of, of workers was fairly productive. In fact, very productive. That productivity has diminished over after the first three months, it's gone down. So we now know in terms of efficiency that it doesn't really work well to be outside the office full time. Um, on the other hand, when we get back and we're back in offices, there are some reasons to work from home occasionally. So if you one day a week want to work from home because you're buried with emails and you want to be efficient and you just want to get your emails out of the way and you don't want to be disturbed in your office, you could be pretty efficient in that way. But the one thing that we do know is that creativity, opportunity, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and networking is diminished, if not, you know, gone by not being in an office. So, you know, you, you can tell a story of, uh, there's a guy from BlackRock that was in the equity place and he wanted to be in the debt side. Um, he reported every day to his boss. Uh, he did very, he did all his work. He did very well, but he had no networking capability. So he could never really go call. He had to cold call his boss, his colleague is right next door in the office from him, but he wasn't in the office. So he finally got frustrated, left and chose a different path. But those are the kind of things that just, they're very limiting in, in what's going on. And I think a good example of that is if you look at Facebook, which has 1.5 million square feet in the Hudson Yard, of which they have not occupied the space yet, it's still under construction. In the middle of the pandemic in July, they took an additional 730,000 square feet as part of the office building. So this is a company that said they're not gonna have to have workers come back until June, 2021. And they took from a million and a half square feet, they haven't occupied to it for another 730,000 square feet. So I, I think that the, the trend of office space is not going away. And um, have we been hit? Yes. Uh, but overall, I think that we're, we're, in, we're in pretty good shape going forward as an office uh, user. Um, so so to, to follow up on that, Taryn, uh, what impact have you seen on the new development and even specifically on, on the condo side of the market uh, during COVID? Well, it's been very interesting. And I, you know, I bring this up because I like to talk about the resiliency of the people of this area. I mean, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, the tri-state area, we are some tough people. And if you guys think back to almost about 20 years ago now, 9-11 happened. And everyone said, no one's ever going to want to live in the city again, terrorist attacks, all that stuff. Well, here we are, Every you know, up until this pandemic, Manhattan was still very much alive. It's not that the city died after that. I think there's been a temporary shift and a lot of people kind of thought, oh, I'm never gonna have to go to work ever again and report to my office or maybe go in a couple days a week. And that may very well be the case for some people. Um, but overall, I think employers are gonna still want a butt in a seat <laughs> Monday through Friday because of productivity issues. Um, so we did see this kind of almost mass exodus, but I think we're going to see a lot of people returning to the city and returning to um, you know, the suburbs of Manhattan very close. So it'll be interesting to see how that shift happens once we kind of return to quote unquote normal because we're gonna have a new sense of normal. And what that looks like, I think is going to be very interesting. Um, but just in general, I, I feel like there's these blips and bumps that happen along, along the way. And we have kind of this natural aversion to change in general as people. So we get fearful and our gut reaction is to go do something about it. And a lot of people moved out of the city, but I think a lot of people are definitely gonna come back. So there's not a, a death of Manhattan or a death of um, you know New Jersey's Gold Coast. That's something I definitely wanna you know, say that I, I, I don't foresee that happening. Maybe the market is softened, but I think we were due for that anyway. You know what, Taryn, it's interesting. We had, um, we're friendly with a, a historian um, whose name is, is Kevin Draper. And we had him come in and give our sales crew a, a, a talk at one of our regular morning meetings. And um, he has this speech that he gives about 
the fact that this isn't the first New York City pandemic, mm -hmm. that there have actually been four pandemics before. And um, it was fascinating and uplifting. And he wasn't a salesman y, schmaltzy kind of guy, but he just laid out the facts. And every century had a pandemic. I think the 1600s was cholera, um, typhoid fever in the 1700s, then you had the Spanish flu in 1918. But he delineate, delineated the fact that, um, you know, at every one of those inflection points, people were bailing out of the city right and left. But yet, anywhere from a year to two years later, the, the people came rushing back into the city and there was this euphoria. Um, and, and like, by example, the 1918 Spanish flu uh, was, was followed by the Roaring Twenties, which were a time in the city where the economy was booming, people were out socializing and, and, and you can see it happening again. I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about, um, first of all, very happy uh, that we're gonna get the people who are most vulnerable vaccinated right away. But the city, you know, if you really look at the, uh, the charts of where land prices are and investments are, and um, you know, we're, we're in for a really good time, I think, moving forward. I agree. And I, I think, you know, the development world um, from a developer's kind of mindset, developers work counter cyclically. So this is the time to purchase land and to get into the market for a new development opportunity. Because if you look at the timeline from acquisition to sellout, you're looking at a minimum of a two, three year timeline there between your approvals and everything. So it'll be very interesting to see all the properties that got scooped up and what people are going to do with them. Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing some really interesting things happening around the city. Um, everyone knows that it's not a big secret that land prices in the Bronx were traditionally half of what they were in Brooklyn and Queens. Um, so there was always that, that, that dichotomy. But the, uh, uh, it, that shift is narrowing. And you know we're looking at developers who are thinking about what's the market going to be like four years from now in the Bronx when when you've got great infrastructure, you've got good communities, and um, um, and so we're seeing people making bets that are counter cyclical, especially in the boroughs. So Paul, let me let me ask you then if if land prices have corrected and you know we're at a lower cost basis. What do you think that means for new development as we move forward 2021, even 2022? Well, I think like Kent would know better than I would, but I mean, I don't know where, um, how construction prices have, uh, costs, excuse me, have, have um, reacted during this time. Is, is that another opportunity? I, it, it, all, it, all, it all needs to add up, right? You have to, you have to have the, the basis and the property, you have to be able to build affordably um, and you have to have rents that uh, that make the math work. Well, I tell you, the, de the development sites, you know, up to certainly 2015 and, and a little bit post were all sold as, co as condominiums because the, there was no way that you really could afford the development sites and, and build to a rental. So that, that, was, that was a problem. But going back in, um, you know, construction prices are actually increased during COVID right now, and and which seems odd, but but if you look at the logistics of deliveries and and the schedule of delays and other things, it actually drove costs up a little bit. I do think going forward now, you're going to see for new bidding, you're going to see costs go down. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of construction companies that are very hungry for business, including ours, um, and I think they're going to be pricing very very narrowly. On the other hand, there have been some companies that have gone under because they didn't make it through this environment. So I think you've got some, you've got fewer companies doing some of the work. So it, it's, it'll be interesting. I do believe that prices, you know, prices on land are going to decline a little bit. Prices on on uh, construction will decline a little bit, whether soft costs do or not. Uh, interest rates certainly, but whether other soft costs do is is still open for debate. Um, and then hopefully we can gain back and, and start building some rental housing because the city. As you said, Paul, earlier, the city is in desperate need for, for, for more housing, especially rental housing. Um, and and that a lot of the development occurred at the super luxury end, which is a very razor thin market at best. Um, you know, there's only 2,500 billionaires in the world. How many of them who don't have an apartment here really want an apartment or are going to buy one? 
Um, although these developers, especially along 57th Street, started building for all of those people that don't really exist. And that's what hit the marketplace a little bit prior to COVID. So um, hopefully I'm cautiously optimistic that we can regain some footing in some of the, the much needed housing for, for, you know, for real people with real jobs doing real work. And I think that's that's pretty, you know, thoughtful. And, and I think what um, has happened through COVID is people have taken the time because they've had the time now to pause and say, okay, wait, we have to re-strategize. We have to rethink this. You know, even um, one of the kind of initiatives that DMG is taking is uh, modular housing. So I, I'm very interested to see how much modular housing comes into play and to the forefront for more affordable style development, especially in the rental space. Hey, Christian, are there any uh, new metrics that have emerged, especially during the pandemic that uh, DMG is now looking at when they consider a new development? Yeah, so there's, you know, we, we always look at, um, you know, the, the key fundamentals of the market space um, anytime we go into a new market. Um, so one, one thing that we're really keen on right now is making sure that there's long-term growth in population um, and, and something that's going to be resilient to lockdowns or uh, potential shifts in um, kind of day-to-day -day operations of, a, of someone's uh, business or something like that. So we look for, for companies in that area and businesses that are, that are resilient to shifts like that, um, that have good track records. Um, because they're going to be able to supply our our investments and our, our buildings with renters that are there going to be there for long term and have long term demand. That may not have been something that we considered or had weighted as heavily in the past, um, just due to the fact that we we didn't have to con be concerned with the pandemic, right? Population shifts were were very we could look at trends and you know see be very uh, secure on those. Now we're looking into what are some specific, um, you know, backgrounds of the companies and the the reasons that those individuals are coming to that area um, and and relocating and what the sustainability of that is. So, you know, that that's something that we're we're keyed in on um, specifically for short term view. You know, again, as we've we've mentioned, long term, um, post pandemic, post vaccine, um, we don't think that that's going to be something we're having to wait as heavily again. Uh, but it's something that with the additional research, we're definitely layering in kind of an additional understanding of those markets. And it's, it's helped us inform, you know, especially for programming and, um, you know, the, the building choices that, and design that we're going with. You know, it, it kind of informs the different levels of that uh, investment thesis. Have there been any areas uh, of, of savings for as far as operations go during the COVID season? Yeah, you know, there have been some unique opportunities. And, um, you know, as everyone knows, there's been some unexpected expenses with the, the pandemic as well on the operations side. Um, things like additional cleaning supplies, you know, the, the I'm sure you've all seen like the specialized tape and the antimicrobial uh, product that's out there. So while we've had some unexpected expenses, uh, we've had some uh, unexpected savings as well. We've been able to reposition uh, some of our service contracts um, to, to more better reflect the services that we've been able to provide. Um, we've been able to renegotiate some utility uh, contracts and, and really just look for cost-saving measures um, where, you know, in, in a typical year, we'd be doing this process anyway, but there are some real opportunities in some of those areas now, and we have more negotiating power um, to come to the table with because of the pandemic, and we can, we can leverage those different um, stances. So those those were two main ways to that we've discovered that we can really uh, trim our budgets um, and maximize our NOI throughout the year is uh, is ensuring that we're we're really negotiating those uh, service contracts and those uh, monthly services um, and also looking at those utilities um, see if we can reposition any of our contracts. Um, I don't know if anyone's been monitoring the kind of nationwide utility pricing. Uh, we've actually had some significant opportunities uh, earlier this year for savings, and we were able to lock in at lower rates for a lot of our uh, uh, supply, uh, which is a great opportunity. And we've, we were able to lock in for an, the next few years at, at really a discounted price because of the shift in demand. So, uh, Taryn, you've been on the front line of, of all the changes that sales and marketing and, and new developments have seen during the pandemic. 
Uh, I was wondering what examples you might have of some ways that developers and, and brokers have been able to up their game as far as technology goes to show and sell property over the past year. Well, I, the amazing thing is, is that we've had these tools the entire time. It's just finding different applications for them and being creative. Um, you know, again, this has been an opportunity for us to kind of do some soul searching on what we need to do and, and be proactive in doing virtual tours and providing more tech-based showings for people. We did FaceTime tours, pre-recorded tours, all of those things were things that we leveraged as a company previously. And we just thought of this as every person we're working with is an international buyer. So let's treat them as that and get them as much information as possible. But one of the unique things that we did too was we still offered in-person tours. We just had a, a more stringent um, screening process, even at the height of the pandemic where no one was going out, we were actually still offering in-person tours. We were just very creative, very careful. Um, and, and I think that's gone a long way is that human element and continuing to have those types of interpersonal relationships with people because this socially distanced um, society that we're in right now, you know, as we were discussing earlier, masks and social distancing post-vaccine probably won't exist anymore. And it's because we're social beings. People want to interact with one another. That's why we're hosting things like we're doing today is for that interaction, for that connection. Um, and buying a home is a very emotional process. I know from the development side, it's numbers and business and does this pencil out. But from the consumer side and the buyer side of it, it's a lot of money and it's where they're going to sleep and live and make memories. So we still have to add that human element back into it. So we, we've talked a lot about residential. We've talked about commercial. Uh, retail, of course, is another sector that's been hit you know, really hard, disproportionately hard during the pandemic. Uh, Kent would love if, if you could share some insights into what you think the current state of retail is. Well, first of all, it's hurting. I mean, there's no doubt about it. The restaurants and retail is, 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 is in deep, deep pain right now. Um, but if, if I step back a little bit and look uh, at what was going on prior to the COVID, retail had been changing already dramatically. So um, I, I like to say, you know, what Sir Isaac Newton said, which is that uh, matter is neither created nor destroyed, it merely changes its form. And that's what retail is doing. Retail is clearly going through a form change. So are people still buying shirts and clothing and are they buying watches and sunglasses and all the other things that they do? Yes. Are they getting them in a different way? Absolutely. So you, you buy them online, um, your paper product you're buying online, you don't have to go shop. So that, that was a change that was occurring and prices were adjusting accordingly. So the big box users that were out there uh, before with the idea that, gee, I need a big Manhattan store because it's great for marketing. And if I have a hundred stores around the United States and I have one in Manhattan and I lose money on that, it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll chalk up the market, I'll chalk up the loss to marketing and it'll benefit all my other hundred stores. That's just not happening anymore. So what, what's happening? We're gonna end up with smaller stores we're going to end up with more mama papa type services. So like Paris, where you go in and you have small chocolatiers and you've got florists and you've got great coffee places, you've got great juice places. All of these things that you're not going to buy online are going to be there. Um, and what's that going to do to New York City? It's going to make it a much more diverse, much more interesting and much better neighborhood type place. Um, so in essence, we're going back to some of the older type operations that we had, you know, pasta makers and all that. And it makes for a great, great opportunity. Now, are prices going down? Yes, prices are going down. That's fine. But if you're a big office building and you've got retail, will you take a little bit of a hit? Yes. But is it going to over, uh, you know, overall impact your, your major um, building? Not so much. If you're a smaller building, you've got some issues. I will say that I think one trend that's going to be going on is the fact that um, you've got retailers that are out of business. 
um, restaurants that are going out of business or potentially coming back. And we'll be, we'll be in a game of musical chairs. Everybody will be shifting around and moving around and starting and starting over. Um, so for the brokers out there, I think that it, that will, there'll be a lot of activity um, and people will be coming back and restaurants will be opening, um, but they may not be in the same place that they were before. And then that's a shame. We've got some restaurants, you know, the 21 Club, which we just read about, um, you know, been out there, what is it, 90 years and, and may, not, may not be there anymore. You know, th those are the kind of things that are devastating in the marketplace. But the resiliency of the New York City marketplace, the resiliency of the young population who are, you know, who have been less than, than um, careful in some cases with COVID are itching to come back. And, and, you know, so we will see activity, we will see strength, we will see opportunity, but granted it will be at a different price. So just a reminder to everybody watching, if, if there's a question that you wanna ask one of the panelists, you can submit your questions through the Q&A forum that's at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, I see we have a bunch of questions coming in. So in I was a few minutes, one other thing I was just gonna say on retail, the other, sure. but I think also, which in this poll may be able to comment on, I think what's going on is that you have retail tenants out um, you've had, and, and some residential people out. So you've had smaller buildings that would never have been in a development type of, of uh, opportunity before where you can start assembling. I think this is gonna create opportunities for buildings that all, you know, all of a sudden they've lost some of their tenants. They've gotten tenants out that they never thought they could get out. And an alternative that didn't exist before, which is to be part of a development site or part of an assemblage. Uh, I think you're gonna start seeing over you know, the next year to three years, you're gonna see some opportunity on the development site uh, assemblage uh, that's going on. Yeah, the, um, we are seeing it, Kent. The, um, s some of the tenants who unfortunately are uh, getting hammered by the virus are, are, are making people rethink, uh, making owners rethink their long-term strategy. If they were gonna retire and sell five years from now, I think I think you see this a lot with with respect to a lot of things in the um, lifestyle and life planning during the virus. A lot of people have had their life accelerated by five years where they probably would have gotten there anyway. But we thought that retail was had bottomed out prior to the virus. I thought that the technology had killed the tenants they were going to kill, and we were we were going to be more focused on personal services. Uh, tenants and those are the ones the virus hit the most, but I think they'll be back. And I think um, the adjustment from the virus will be quick again. Um, nationally, um, a lot of mall owners that aren't big box, um, strip centers, supermarket anchored um, uh, centers are experiencing pretty strong occupancy even through the virus. So I think um, the fundamentals of retail, well, you know, pe people want to want to want to go out, and they're going to go out in numbers and and be out shopping and be out hanging in bars and restaurants, and it'll snap back quickly. I think. I hope so. Like Kent so mentioned sure. before, the okay. kind of millennial population they did they were out partying, drinking, doing all kinds of stuff during this, and you're just looking wide eyed at what are you doing, but. Those are people that no matter what, they want to go out. They want to enjoy themselves. And when we get post COVID, we're going to be thanking, thankfully, these people are going to come back and repopulate here. So you look at, we, we, New York lost about, New York City lost about 300,000 change of addresses, which may have been about almost 450,000 people. When you look at who left, half of those people were, you know, restaurant workers, retail workers, and hotel workers. Whether it's the same people or not, they will be coming back to New York fairly quickly. And then you lost, you know, probably 150,000 people or 275,000 people for real that moved out. But interestingly enough, 50% of them have moved within a two hour radius of New York City. So they either moved into, uh, and these are, these are change of addresses, so we don't know if it's temporary or not. Um, but they moved that, you know, these are people who kept their, their, their link to Manhattan, New York City, the boroughs. And, um, so whether they come back full time or not, we'll see. And that'll depend on school years if they have children. But um, it, it, you start tracing out where 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 everybody went. This isn't like everybody just picked up and moved to Texas and Florida. Um, so it's it 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 wasn't quite like that. Um, thankfully. 
And, and Ken, just to piggyback off of that, from our, our student housing portfolio, we're seeing a lot of optimism for the future in even the spring semester um, and the fall of 2021. Um, we're noticing the students in that, that age group demographic are really hungry to get back to campuses, to get back with their communities um, in, in situations where they may not have in-person classes now. And even during COVID where a lot of online classes are happening, we're seeing high levels of occupancy in those campuses, which is you know, indicative of you know, that optimism, that uh, placing value on the fact of that interpersonal communication um, and those interactions. But you know, I, I think broadening that is, if that's a microcosm, I think broadening that to apply to the, a New York City type market where um, it's still very much a destination you know, location. I mean, who doesn't wanna make it in New York City, right? That's not gonna change just because of this. And in fact, it may be even more amplified because of the additional challenge that is, it's been facing. Uh, in 2020, I, and I, I know that you know, in talking with uh, some other industry peers, that that's still a conversation. Is people want to get into New York City? Um, people want to move there, get work here, uh, and live in the city. And and that's definitely a really encouraging sign. Um, you know, they're just waiting for the right opportunities, and and I think those opportunities will come back in a in a very broad way. Well, Christian, I'll send I'll send last thoughts over to you, and then I'm going to pass it to Anthony for the Q and A. Uh, would love to get your outlook from DMG on what you think 2021 is going to look like. Yeah, so I, as kind of the theme of the the webinar, DMG Investments is extremely optimistic about 2021. Uh, we see a really exciting pipeline for both new development um, and also acquisitions. Um, so, um, so that's kind of on our our new business side, but. Uh, for our current operations, um, you know, still just seeing some really strong metrics for rebound um, and continued growth, uh, both on the rental side and at One Park Condos, where we're selling, you know, units at a, a very high rate right now. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, people matriculating from New York City, or they're they're looking for maybe a secondary location to have available to them. Uh, so we're still seeing that at One Park Condos, and that trend that we're seeing is is, is likely to continue. So at DMG Investments, we're, we're very optimistic. We're really excited um, at the growth opportunities that we have uh, coming up. All right, that's a good note to end on. So Anthony, I'll pass it over to you for the Q&A. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. Pleasure. Thanks guys. We, uh, we have a question from John Marcos. And this question came in when Paul was speaking. What about factors such as de Blasio, Biden, no bail, safety, rise in taxes? And Paul, you can answer this stuff. as well as, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, both Paul and Kent, your, your thoughts. Sure. Go first, Ken. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, let's just take a look. Um, the answer is yes, those all impact what's going on. So I'm gonna take three things. Um, number one, what's gonna make New York City strong and healthy and good? Um, we need health safety, period. So. Um, New York City is the densest city in the United States with 28,000 people per square mile. San Francisco is number two with 17,000 square mile, uh, 17,000 people per square mile, and it falls precipit precipitously off after that. So health safety, need that. And good, good news for us, we have a vaccine, we have a second vaccine, and maybe a third vaccine will go forward. So somewhere in the April, May period of time, we may start regaining some stability and being able to go back out. So that's it. Number two, we need physical safety. We need cooperation between the police force and we need cooperation with the civilian population. So there is no population, whether it's the NBA, the United States House of Representatives, every webinar there is, there is no such thing as 100% purity in population. There are people that make mistakes. The police are no different. What the police have to do is recognize that 1%, 2%, whatever it is of their population, aren't perfect people and they have to accept it, recognize it and deal with it. And secondly, the civilian population needs to say, no, all the police aren't bad. In fact, most of them are all good, but a couple of people have made horrendous mistakes. And the civilian population and the, and, 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 and the police have to work together as a community saying that we're out to do good things and they need to be supporting one another. That means not to defund police. You may even have to increase money to train people more. And the third thing we need, because of our density, when one of the strengths is, is transportation. We need $13 billion from the federal government. We need it soon to keep and maintain our public transportation. 
And then people say, why should the federal government give all New Yorkers all this money? Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. If Paul and I are in partnership together and Paul is at home because he's smart and great and he's doing all these things and I'm out on the street running around doing all the work. Paul says, oh, Kent, why don't you call here? Why don't you go there? But he's sitting back at home and getting 50% of everything I get because we're partners and I'm out in the street get, and doing the work. And then I break my leg and all of a sudden I'm in the hospital. My guess is because I'm making a lot of money for Paul, he probably will pick up the phone and say, hey, Kent, I hope you feel better. He may even actually come visit me with flowers. He's gonna, and he may even say, what can I do to get you back on the street as quickly as you can so I can get my 50%. Well, so Paul's the federal government, right? New York City pays an enormous amount of money in taxes, much more than we get to the federal government. So if New York City breaks its leg, the federal government should be stepping in here and saying, what can we do to make you feel better and get better as quickly as you can so you can give us more money? Now, if you're Kentucky, where you're getting 100 times more than you're paying out, you break your leg, you know what? I'll send a note, but that's it, right? I'm going to be relieved because I don't have to keep paying you all this money. New York is a driving force. So federal government needs to recognize that we are a driver. We spend an enormous amount of money into the federal coffers, and they need, when we get hurt, to help us. And that's what we need right now. With those three things, I think that New York is going to go, and we need a, a mayor, a, um, a person who has an understanding of, of that and can speak to the community. Such as an example, there's a guy, Eric Adams. Here's a guy who was, was beaten up by police when he was young, right? So he wasn't, he wasn't you know, a, a black leader now, wasn't thrilled when he was beaten up. And, and, and what, did he, what did he do? He joined the police force for 22 years, rose to captain. I mean, so he can speak into the black population, he can speak into the blue population, right? Which is the, uh, the, the police. And at least when people are speaking to one another and listening, you have a shot. So regardless of policies, you need somebody first who's accepted by all the population bases and can work with people and be listened by that. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, that was that was great, Kent. Paul, you were gonna run for mayor and I, I guess you did. What would you have done differently compared to de Blasio right now? Um, let's just say that we have a super we have a super leadership opportunity ahead of us now. The the election is coming up in November. Um, de Blasio is termed out, so it'll be someone new. Um, and there are a whole bunch of great candidates that are emerging. Sean Donovan, who worked uh, with Bloomberg and, and in the Obama administration, uh, has th thrown his hat into the ring. Uh, Ray McGuire, a Citibank uh, vice chair is considering running. Andrew Yang, who was a pretty great presidential candidate is considering jumping in too. So I think, uh, I think all that's really great because we have so much opportunity in the city to um, help the million kids that are, in, that are in our public school system, uh, be a business friendly uh, city, attracting tenants, um, unlike the way that we, um, didn't embrace Amazon and um, and and I think you know again we have a housing shortage so what are we going to do about that so we can help folks who need we need to support um, so that we're not a barbell society full of wealthy folks and 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 folks that are uh, worse off um, with no middle class so we want it we want to be a city where everyone can live and um, I, again I think. I think we'll, we'll likely have a mayor who will be uh, much more capable of addressing the things that are all important to us. Thank you, Paul. Hey, Ken, Ro Malik. Uh, Ken, with the Facebook example, do you see an oversupply of office space in the city and tri-state area for years to come? Are there areas of commercial real estate that are doing better than others? If so, what are the asset classes are doing better in this COVID, the COVID era? Um, so right now we're in an environment that we're not expanding clearly because we've got a problem. So roughly right now we're at uh, 12 and a half percent vacancy rate or availability rate plus or minus. So it's been the highest it has for, for quite some time. Um, in that marketplace, 26% of all of the office space available today is sublet space. 
So that tells you, and it's the highest it's ever been. So that tells you that there are a lot of companies that are hurting and putting they're putting their place out uh, for rent. So do we have over over abundance of space? I don't think we have an overabundance of space, but we certainly have a tenant favorable um, a tenant favorable marketplace right now. Um, you know, as an example, I'm in one of my companies is in the building uh, right now at 444 Madison. It takes typically uh, 2,000 people a day go in the building. Yeah, uh, the other day we had 88 people, right? Helmsley Square made up, of, and Falcon Pacific made up a fair amount of those 88 people. Um, so yes, there, there's a problem out there right now. Um, and there'll be an adjustment over the years, over a period. I, I don't think that we're gonna have an issue um, with that, I don't think we've had overbuilding per se. I think we do have a problem because of COVID and people re-examining how they want to have office space, what they want to do, and it'll take a year or so or more to adjust. But I'm optimistic of, of, of what New York is doing. And, and there are some people saying, you know, people are moving out of major cities. So, you know, you, you can get somebody moving out with their quote headquarters out of New York City on paper because they're going to be paying a different price in taxes in a state like Florida or Texas, but they're not moving all their people out of here. They're gonna still have a lot of people. They're still gonna be doing a lot of work. New York City is New York City. We still have a population of over 8 million people and, um, and, and we matter. So, you know, yes, it's, there's, there are cycles and we're not in a cycle where it's booming for the landlords. Um, and maybe that gives more opportunity to some of the tenants who can afford rent a little bit and give them a little bit of ease as we go into the marketplace. Thank you, Quinn. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken. Uh, Brendan Cohen, with regards to the revised PIDE and tax proposal in Albany that's discriminating only New York City PIDE and tear of the market value of 300,000, an annual tax of approximately 10% of the market value excess of over 300,000, what is your network intel in concern about the flood of apartments on the market? And this could be, I guess, Christian. You know that that's one I have to, uh, you know, rely on um, some, some better intel on. That's not something that is uh, in the forefront of our uh, uh, lens right now. Look, the punitive tear tax is not a good thing, right? And it and 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 the concept is that somebody is is wealthy and buying an apartment in New York, and therefore there should be a higher tax on that person. Um, the reverse idea is this. If you have a person with a pied to tear, right, so they're not in New York full time, they're paying their taxes, they're paying their utilities, they're paying all of the things and they're not using, and they're paying for their public school tax, all the stuff that go along with that. And yet they're not using any of the services. So another way to look at it is that they're already paying a disproportionate share of, of services that they are not using. So it's actually a benefit to us to have pied to tears in New York because you've got people who don't live here participating in society and paying money into our society and our city. Um, without use, utilizing all of those services. So um, the problem is New York City needs, New York State both need more money. Um, and and I've always found that, you know, it, it, the same as children, if you incentivize people and you incentivize your children, it becomes a lot easier than being when you try to punish your way through changing behavior. So if we're looking to change behavior, we're looking to raise taxes, we're looking, I mean, to get more money, you don't always need to raise taxes. I think, I think you know, it, it was it was criminal what happened with a, with um, with Amazon not going in to Queens, for instance. So you know they wanted to punish Amazon. Everybody said, "Oh my gosh, look at that! They're not going to pay real estate taxes or for ten years. They're going to get one billion dollars of of, tax, of free taxes." Well, nobody looked at the fact that six of the seven sites that Amazon was going to occupy are already owned by the city and have not received taxes in almost 50 years. <laughs> so what did we give away? We gave away nothing because we're not collecting anything. And now that we, you know, thankfully Amazon didn't come, we're still collecting nothing on six of those seven sites. I mean, that was a joke. So people like, and no offense, but AOC who went and just viscerally went and said, this is a bad thing because this industry are uneducated, poorly viewing and hurting their own community. And that is not smart. So yes, we need some tax benefits, but we need to be intelligent in the way we approach this stuff with our shortfall. Thank you, Ken. I, think I, I agree with that. The, the, um, the city and the state so mishandled that. And what did Amazon do? They were making a million four 
uh, office commitment. They, they, they backed out and six months later started acting like a, an ordinary commercial tenant. And how much space have they taken? Two million without any need to subsidize education, jobs the way they were. So um, Amazon's got to be looking at New York City and, you know, thinking that um, they did them a huge favor. And, and they also, so they didn't, they didn't get 25,000 new jobs in Queens where they needed it. They came into Manhattan and that's where the yeah. city was foolish. Yeah. So, I mean, Amazon needs to be in New York. It's making, besides its last mile delivery acquisitions, which are massive around the boroughs, um, they, they, they need to be here. Facebook needs to be here. Um, and um, so I think when people think about the market um, long-term being um, difficult on the office side. I don't think so. I think it's like, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's another, just another example of a, a different type of tragedy where we had 9-11. A lot of companies were very nervous and wanted ha to have duplicate headquarters outside New York, New Jersey, Stanford, no offense to any of those markets. But two years later, the real estate industry made a fortune bringing those companies back to New York City. Same thing's going to happen now. Guys, this is actually, we're, we're at our end right now. Um, many of you that did not have your uh, questions answered, we will definitely copy them, send them to the guys, and then they will answer you guys back privately. Um, Christian, before we conclude, tell us a little bit about, you see, I have about four or five webinars coming in the future, especially Westchester County, Connecticut. They're talking about the, of course, that number that Ken mentioned about that 300,000 people leaving the city, but a lot of those guys are not only leaving the city to live, but they're also leaving the city to work, especially White Plains and in Connecticut as well. Can you tell us a little bit about, maybe you and Taryn could just finish this last question and tell us what are you seeing in New Jersey right now, just right over the river? Are a lot of people coming into that, your new buildings at um, you know, DMG Investment Properties in New Jersey? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And thanks to all our panelists today. Um, just, just great conversation and dialogue. So I appreciate you all. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, Richard for uh, moderating. Um, you know, what we're seeing is um, we are seeing matriculation has been well documented from New York City out into kind of dispersing in the areas. And um, at one park, our, our main condo building right on the right on the edge there of the, the Gold Coast, um, you know, we're, we're, we are seeing increased uh, interest um, and, and trending more positively um, to, uh, you know, living situations that like that, where it's, it's more, uh, they can, uh, you know, it's, it's less dense because it's not in the city, but they can still commute very easily and they can, are still within striking distance, basically, of New York City. And we're seeing that that's something that's very important to our, uh, our consumers still is they want to be close enough where they can get there if they need to but they don't want to live there right now. So that's something that we're, we're still monitoring and still seeing because, you know, as, as we transition out of, and, you know, after everyone has the vaccine, we've got this herd immunity or whatever that means as we move forward, um, those individuals who moved away, but not far enough that they can't commute are going to start commuting back to the city. We're going to see that, that shift go back and, you know, the, the nine to five uh, shift will go, back into the city and, and occupying those office spaces, supplying those restaurants. And so we're seeing that people are moving away, but they're not moving so far away um, that they can't still get there. And so that's something that we're really excited to see. Um, and I think it's gonna create a lot of opportunities in New York City, as everyone's mentioned, for um, kind of a new wave of population to move in there um, at some really exciting opportunities and price points. Great. Um, Taryn, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing right now with this kind of mass exodus of Manhattan, it's temporary. It's, you know, that frenzy mentality like everyone had with toilet paper. They're freaking yeah. out and going and buying suburban houses <laughs> because they're like, oh my gosh, we, we need to get out there now. The city's never coming back. Let's, let's have this conversation again in uh, a year or two and see how many of those people are putting their houses up for sale because the commute is too much and they can't take it or God forbid the other millions of things that could happen. You know, there's, there's gonna be a lot of changes 
in familial status, I'm sure, from commutes and, and all of those other things, people needing pied a terres in Manhattan um, because they've moved two hours away to Connecticut or something like that. So it'll be interesting to see how the dynamics change. And with all of these types of situations, there's opportunities and how people take advantage of those opportunities is to each their own. And I'm excited to see where we go in terms of development, both residential, commercial, and otherwise. Oh, that's great, Taryn. And I'm just gonna ask this one more question to Paul. Paul, you have a brokerage business. Is your teams, are your teams doing more deals? Are you seeing a lot of businesses, especially retail, going into the boroughs, going to Westchester, Connecticut? Are you seeing more stuff leaving? And are you uh, helping those clients? No, the, um, I, I think most people are, you know, committed to New York in terms of uh, uh, the long term. I think we're, we're selling, it's interesting, we're selling development sites. Again, I already mentioned this, but um, it, with uh, that, that have, have pretty healthy numbers in the boroughs. We're also, any industrial property or anything that could be last mile delivery, we're selling at the asking price. There's a, there's a spike in that segment of the market, which uh, I don't think is going to let up. So we, we probably just don't have enough product in that, in that category at the moment, but, um, but that'll change. And, um, and on the multifamily side, we need to work out what's going to happen with uh, rent regulations. I, I, that, that was a, another you know, opportunity for the city to shoot itself in the foot. Uh, by not allowing people to raise rents and fix up buildings. I think that the, the net result of that will be that you're going to have uh, major budget holes besides what the virus will produce on the multifamily side because half the city's uh, operating budget, the $97 billion, comes from taxes on those buildings. So um, we, need to, we need to get together with the folks in Albany and fix the rent regulation so that... Um, the, the underpinning and the most important revenue generator for the city is back in business. Great. You know, guys, I'm just going to finish off with Ken. Ken uh, and again, everybody that where I did not answer your question will copy it and we will definitely have people respond back to you. Uh, Ken, Brian Rothschild, what about all the financial companies that say they will permanently work remotely? How are we filling that space? Um, Thankfully, in my opinion, we won't have to fill that space. They won't be working remotely fully. Um, will home officing be incorporated in as part of our society and our work environment? I think yes, it will to some extent. Um, but even the most, I don't wanna say mundane, but even the most straightforward mathematical calcul calculations, people who do accounting and, and, and go through a cycle like that, don't operate as well and as efficiently, as efficiently um, being remote. You know, we found accounting people were making mistakes. They forget to close out a book you know, for a month or whatever it is. They're, they're problems. So it, it's not as efficient and it doesn't really work as well. Um, so will we have short-term office space availability now that's in excess of what we had? We were 9% vacancy. We're up to almost 13% vacancy now. Yes, that's a result of the COVID environment and its, and its detrimental impact in our society and our economy and our business. Um, but I don't think that we're looking at a fundamental change that everybody's gonna be working now from home and offices are gonna be obsolete. So I don't, I don't think that's um, gonna happen. And those companies that did move out ultimately found that they, were, they weren't as efficient, they weren't as creative. And that's why the companies like Amazon and Facebook and, and Google and all these other companies come into New York because the young people want to be here. The energy is here. Vitality is here. Creativity, etc. And um, so, I'm not cautiously foolish, but I am cautiously optimistic that that office space is not is going to be a part of our fabric of our economy. Thank you, Ken. Guys, this concludes the winter webinar series with DMG Investments, and I want to thank our sponsors, DMG Investments. I also want to.
thank our, of course, our panelists, uh, Christian and Taryn and Richard and Paul and Kent. You guys were all fantastic. Once again, also like to thank all the registers and all the attendees that registered today. So thank you. And this concludes everything. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Well done, Anthony. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Nice to see you. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.